So it's, a, it's with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker today, Tayaki Alfred. He's a Bear Clan uh, Mohawk from Ganawagi, uh, uh, and, uh, and he's also a professor of uh, indigenous governance and political science at the University of Victoria. Uh, his work on uh, traditional governance, the restoration of land-based uh, cultural practices, and of course, decolonization strategy is broadly acknowledged, I think, not only in Canada, but uh, around the world. Uh, I've met people from a lot of number of places uh, doing uh, research and uh, doing uh, top uh, work, so obviously, uh, <laughs> uh, his writing, of course, includes a number of articles and essays, uh, and most of not only, of course, are his books. His most recent was Sassi, Indigenous Pathways of Action and Freedom, Peace, uh, Power, Righteousness, that I see on the table there. And uh, his first book, Heeding the Voice of Our Ancestors, a book about uh, Ganawagi, that uh, on a personal basis, I, I have to say, I first read that book when I was an undergrad, and this is pretty much what inspired me to, uh, to work and try to understand the uh, issues on this uh, relations uh, work in political science. Uh, of course, Tayaki's work is uh, both compelling, inspiring, and also challenging. He rejects the status quo and is not afraid of questioning entrenched uh, ideas about culture, identity, politics, and power. Uh, and of course, his contribution to indigenous uh, uh, freedom uh, does not end, end with his words. Uh, Tayaki also is engaged has, and has contributed to his work as an advisor uh, with indigenous communities to uh, uh, the emergence or the re-emergence, I'd say, of uh, more activists, uh, uh, a younger generation of uh, indigenous people. So without further ado, I think I've talked enough about uh, <laughs> please, um, please join me in welcoming uh, uh, sense here today. Um, I'm going to, to talk to you about the psychic landscape of contemporary colonialism, which is, I think, the most provocative title that I could uh, <laughs> suggest to Martin, and obviously it was successful in, uh, in getting people to come out. And uh, <coughs> what I mean by focusing on this uh, psychic uh, aspect is how we think about and how we understand uh, what the struggle is that our people are facing. Um, how is it that we think about and process and how it affects us as, as people, and then how do we channel that into a program of political action, cultural action, and so forth? For me, uh, over the years, this has come to be uh, the main thing that I've grappled with in trying to put forward something new for the people to consider, for the people to use in surviving and building up our strength again. Um, I was talking with uh, Marte and uh, my friend Brad uh, earlier this morning and thinking about a way to say something that people who have read my books and studied them and heard me talk uh, numerous times, uh, how I could say something that would be uh, innovative, that wouldn't bore them, and, uh, but yet still get to the, to the heart of the matter as far as, uh, as far as what I think the key issue is that we're facing right now. And I think what I'm going to do is take the approach of tracing my own uh, intellectual and to a certain extent, uh, certain extent um, personal development through the process of decolonizing. And um, the books that were mentioned, I think, are a, a kind of, a, are, they're artifacts of that. I mean, the way that I work, and I think really good <coughs> scholarship, if I may say so, is always reflective of the fact of a lived experience and a reflection of that and a working through a lived reality on the part of the author 
and a contribution of, of insight and knowledge coming out of that. And so I've always approached that. I mean, that's the lesson that I was taught uh, as a young person coming into this environment, uh, working with some really dedicated people who were involved for years and years in struggles in our communities and who were doing really good work in the academy. And so uh, I've always taken that to heart and it's come to define the approach that I have. I don't write about anything that I haven't experienced or lived myself. And I'm not really saying that, I'm not saying that in any way to project uh, arrogance. I hope you're not taking it that way. I'm doing it because I honestly, I'm saying that because I honestly believe that that is the true pathway to wisdom and to, in the context of the, of the issues that we're talking about here, the self-knowledge that you need in order to recognize your position in relation to colonialism and imperialism and the way that you can transcend that and remake yourself in order to be something which reflects the best values of uh, the ancestral culture and the ancestors uh, that we uh, pay homage to as the people that are our reference as to what is a good way of life. Um, I refer to it in psychic terms because I think that uh, a big part of this is our understanding of who we are. And so my understanding of who I am, and I think this reflects the, trans <clears throat> the transformation of the political culture and to a certain extent the culture in general in indigenous communities has gone a really substantial, has gone through a number of substantial changes uh, over the years even that I've been involved in it. There's people in the room that have been involved in it much longer than myself. But even since um, I got involved in politics, uh, which is in the mid 80s, uh, up until today, I think there's been at least two or three uh, major transformations on that big question of what is the problem and what are we doing about it? You know, what is colonization and what is decolonization? And, and so the first book that I wrote, uh, which was my dissertation, which was, the, I guess, the most uh, intense period of learning for me uh, intellectually in trying to come to, grip, come to grips with uh, what, uh, what was Ganawage living? What was my community living? Uh, why were we the way we were? And uh, why were we subject to uh, the colonial power of people who had no right to be imposed <coughs> power on us? Why did we lose all our land? Uh, why, are, why were our people uh, behaving towards each other in the way that they were? And so that, that was my instinct in really getting into, into this academic uh, project. And so the understanding that it had at that point reflected, I think, um, my own level of knowledge, self-knowledge and knowledge of the larger context of colonization and indigenous realities in Canada. And I say it, it and I'm going like this when I'm saying it, <laughs> because uh, I think it reflected a level of knowledge, to be sure, but one which, of course, uh, is not the level of knowledge that I think I have now of myself and of those larger realities and, and of the, the, the reality of colonization in particular. So I'll start there and, and just try to go back and take people back to what was colonization, what was, the, what was the Indian problem from the Canadian perspective, and what was our problem from our perspective um, in that era. Uh, when you think about it, it was basically a problem of uh, governance, right? I mean, people thought at that point that the problem that we were facing was that we were governed by others. And as I worked through this, keep in mind, that um, as I move forward, I'm not meaning to say that we've entirely transcended it and that the previous eras are wrong. That in fact it's not true anymore that we're not governed as I move forward to other issues. Okay? It's certainly true that we're, we are governed by others, that the imposition of laws, the imposition of land regimes, the imposition of, uh, of uh, the bank council system, and all this, sort of, all this sort of stuff is wrong. But at the time, I can honestly remember and the work that I did here in Ottawa, uh, was related to the drive to free ourselves from the most direct forms of colonization and control in our communities and over ourselves, which is basically what's come to be known since then as uh, self-government. You know, defining ourselves in different ways and developing the capacity to govern ourselves. And I always remember uh, somebody uh, who who's still around in Ganawagi and still vital and contributing, um, but who has been around you know, on the scene since the 60s, uh, Andrew DeLille Sr., um, really telling me when I was first approaching him for knowledge about this, uh, about what the problem was and what, should, what we should be doing about it, uh, he said, think about where we are now. And in the 80s, when I was, when I was doing this work, um, 
you know, we were we had a bank council. We met. The bank council met. We had elections. Uh, we basically ran our own community the way that we wanted to run it. Um, he was saying it wasn't that long ago. He says it was probably only 10 or 15 years ago when three of us couldn't get together without a priest or an Indian agent or an RCMP officer in the room. If three of us tried to gather, the RCMP would come and break that up. And I mean, that was his explanation as to how bingo became so popular. <laughs> <laughs> so it was brilliant, brilliant, because, you know, we did it in the basement of the church, under the sponsorship of the church, and we all got together and we all did our politics and we all strategized as to how we're going to fight how to fight the government all under the cover of the priest. <laughs> you know, he, he told a lot of stories in it, and it made me think about that, about how far we had come in such a short period of time. And if I recall back to that era, I always remember it also being in the context of uh, a really significant event which you're all quite aware of, which is the constitutional repatriation, you know, and the conception of a Canada opening up now to the possibility of a relationship with First Nations that was not colonial. And so if you think about those two things, the recent freedom of indigenous peoples to actually think to govern themselves and the legal constitutional opening that the, that the Constitution presented after 1982 for a definition of a relationship which was something other than the, than the hard colonialism that had existed before, at least in theory. The potential of these things structured that phase of our political movement. And so colonization became defined institutionally. So when I first came into this business, people were saying, well, what we need to do is take that empty box that is Section 35 of the Constitution, because it was an empty box at the time. I mean, maybe Trudeau and Craig and all those guys in the Justice Department had intentions, but you know, really, it hadn't been defined in courts or in policy at that point. And so what we need to do, and these are, these are the elders that I had at the time, and the teachers and the political activists who were, who were working, telling me what we need to do is really fight hard to define what that bo what's in that box and use that section 35 as the bridge between the Canadian society, the crown, and our nation. Okay, So the crown and the nation. And think about it. At that point, whether you were Cree, uh, Anishinaabe, West Coast, Dene, whatever, those were the terms that were that, that issue was talked about, the crown and the nation. Importantly, the nation. When the Dene were fighting the Mackenzie pipeline in the 70s and 40s, it was the Dene nation. Uh, when people were representing themselves in politics here in Ottawa and so forth, the Assembly of First Nations, the National Indian Brother became the Assembly of First Nations. Very strong still at that point sense of nationhood, of an autonomy, of a, of a nationhood, of an existence that had been suppressed by colonization, by Canadian society. In an effort to free that up, to break from that, and to build a new relationship based on one of the principle of, in, in, our, in our conception, in the Iroquois conception, the two Rwanda, but I understand other indigenous peoples have very similar concepts of a relationship that are, that are reflected in their treaty visions. Okay? And so that, that was the project at the time. And so if you look at the, what, what developed uh, in terms of the thrust of indigenous uh, action at the time, uh, and the response, very limited, always, of course, containing response to the government. There was, there was a back and forth, but it reflected that dynamic of the need to govern ourselves. It was institutionally defined. And I think what you find is that over time, there were varying degrees of success. There were communities that developed the ability to govern themselves and that were convincing enough in, uh, in the government eyes in order to hand over, to devolve some of those powers to the point where First Nations actually began to, uh, in, the, in the sense that we had, to govern ourselves, to make decisions, to, to, to move towards the conception of nationhood that had been the one that was guiding our ancestors and our people in this long era of colonization. I wrote about that in my first, in my first book, and that was my level of understanding. And I would say now that it was kind of, it was a limited understanding, because I think it is in terms of, when you look at uh, decolonization, colonization strictly in institutional terms or structural terms, um, you're forgetting significant parts of the experience of what colonization is and what it did to our people. Um, if it's just a matter of, uh, if colonization, decolonization is simply a matter 
of regaining control over the institutions, the levers of government, the managerial aspects, even the legal constitutional aspects of, of nationhood and so forth, then Africa would be a beautiful place right now for the people that are living there. It's a beautiful place, but is it a beautiful existence coming out of colonization for the vast majority of people that live in Africa, South America, and Asia? Um, no. Because, and, and I'm not saying that on my own uh, uh, subjective analysis. This is the perspective, I think, coming out from people who think about these things in the lived experience from those, from those communities, too. Because I think colonization has been, has been thought of, and decolonization has been thought of, throughout this era as, as structural reform and the regaining of control over law and policy making mechanisms and the capacities of delivering services. Okay? And, that, and that's what, that's what self-government became. And I think that those people who were very concerned uh, became concerned because with that aspect, because they began to see that the intended results of decolonization from that perspective were not happening. When you, when you think about things in terms of the life of your people, the lived experience, the happiness uh, <coughs> quotient in your community, put it that way, uh, the health status, the, the uh, ability for people to relate in a happy, healthy way, to be productive and so forth, to live their own laws on their land, uh, to live out their culture, to have a culture that's resurgent in their community and begins to form the world view for the next generation. And so if you think about it in those terms, Self-government was doing nothing for that. It was doing nothing. And people who are thinking about that began to think about it in a, in a different way. Well, decolonization can't just be about structural reform. It has to have other aspects to it, which seems obvious in retrospect. <laughs> At the time, you know, people who are involved in politics or any project get totally involved in it. In order to be successful, I'm not. I'm not criticizing the elders, the people who are doing all this. I don't want anybody to get that impression. Uh, I'm doing it from a position of uh, being inside and part of it, and reflecting on the experience to, to remind you. Thinking about it, you have to be all in in terms of being successful if you want to be successful in this endeavor. And so, when people get obsessed with taking back power, they, they get obsessed with taking back power, and they begin to structure their personality begin to structure their understandings of the world and the way they relate to others, all for getting back power. And people, if people knew me in the early 90s here in Ottawa, you probably know a different kind of a person, you know, because as any person who is hoping to be successful in that, I was the same, I was, I was totally oriented towards, uh, I wouldn't say emulating, but doing what was necessary, structuring my personality, my way of being, my skill set, my, my, my capacities, to engaging with that opponent in order to gain the victory in that struggle. And I think that our communities came to reflect that. The, the, type, the types of leaders that we have in our community coming out of that era, the type of politics that we have amongst ourselves, the cultures that emerge reflect the fact that when you engage in a struggle, you become like your enemy. And the people that were dissatisfied with that began <coughs> to think about it as a negative thing. And so, referencing back, uh, if your goal is to have a better life as a Ongoi Hongwe and to be able to pass it on to the next generation, we're, uh, we're not succeeding here. This is like the, uh, you know, the early 90s. People, people questioning how the whole self-government project. So for me personally, uh, the, next, the next level of understanding or the different type of understanding, I'll put it in hierarchical terms, but you know, the, next, the, the different type of understanding that I got was uh, reflected in that book that, that uh, some people have here, and also through my experience with the Royal Commission on African Peoples. So I, I said I'd relate it to Ottawa as much as possible <laughs> since I'm in Ottawa. So coming here for self-government negotiations in the 80s, and then coming here significantly for a long period of time uh, in the early 90s and through the mid 90s for the Royal Commission on African Peoples. And I'm sure there's people in this room that had uh, some uh, affiliation and did some work there. Actually, I'd be surprised if anyone was politically active or could read or write and was native at the time that wasn't involved with the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. <laughs> that's, how they, that's how wide a net they threw to try to co-opt us all. <laughs> I say it that way, in hindsight again, because here's the instinct. The instinct is, we need to rethink the whole thing, not just self-government, okay? It's a cultural 
colonization is a cultural process too. Colonization is an economic process. Colonization is a, is a spiritual process. Colonization is all of it. And of course the Royal Commission was an attempt to gather all of that knowledge, put it in a box, put it under the table, and move forward. That's what Royal Commissions do. Uh, we didn't know that at the time. We, uh, we hope that the Royal Commission Aboriginal Peoples would be another opportunity to engage with Canadian society, just, so, just like in the 80 to 10 years earlier, the Constitution was an opportunity to redefine and engage with Canadian society. So the Royal Commission became this massive enterprise of, of laying out knowledge, laying out the reality for our peoples, thinking through it, and coming up with a different sense of what Canada could be and what kind of relationship we could have with Canada. Again, still in the context of nationhood, the nations of people were represented and there was a lot of thought that went through that. The book that I wrote basically reflects you know, my experiences in going through that is that in, in thinking through the so Peace, Power, Righteousness book is really like an expansion of my understanding of what is to be native uh, through this experience here, both just in terms of the exposure to different perspectives from other native people all over the, all over the world basically, but also a deepening of my own understanding through the interactions that I had with teachers from my own nation about what it is to be uh, a Mohawk person, what my responsibilities were, and what the dangers were of engaging in politics and the way that we work. And so uh, the book came out <laughs> fairly critical. Uh, it was a reflection after the fact, of course. It came out in 99, and uh, the Royal Commission went from 92 to 96, some reflection afterwards, and, and here's my, my uh, conception of where we're at. At the point. And I think it's fairly consistent with a lot of the people in our communities at the time in the questioning that they had about where we were going. Okay, so people basically, I mean, bluntly saying, what good is taking back power if all you're going to do is act like a white man with that power? You know, I'd rather have a white man as the Indian agent than some guy that looks like me as the Indian agent, because I get confused when I look at this guy, and sometimes I trust him. He <laughs> looks like, there's one guy that looks like me right there, like, dressed the same as me. Don't trust I get, no, I, I get confused when I look at this guy sitting there, you know? He, he knows to talk, he knows how to, he, he comes from the same place, but yeah, he's doing the same thing as me. So there's got to be a, a substantive, a substantive change and that's what we were hoping for at the time. And that's what this, that, that book there, I think, responds to, the frustration on the part of very many people <coughs> in the community who were still committed to the vision that our ancestors had in fighting colonization. Their so ancestors were fighting for something, which was the right to live on their land, to say it again, to live on their land according to their laws, uh, worshiping their, uh, their gods, and uh, to pass that on to the next generation without being uh, impinged on and without restriction. People who are still committed to that found that that project was self very limited and unacceptable. So there was there was a move towards a cultural resurgence. And, and granted, uh, there's not strict chronology here. All of these things kind of overlap and, and blend into each other. But I think that anybody was around, uh, especially in uh, Odinashoni communities in the late 80s and early 90s and into the 90s, Hopefully you could uh, back me up here and, and talk about the fact that there were there was a very strong uh, push and a, and a widening of the scope of what traditionalism was, how it became the defining feature of our movement, and how many people were involved with it. It became it became uh, the alternative to the assimilated process. It became the alternative institution to uh, the bank council. It became the alternative psychic place to Catholicism and to all of the other identities that have been put on us by the colonizer. And so traditionalism and the critique that came from that of the established order in our communities became a very big uh, issue uh, in our communities at that time. And my book reflects that. You know, the, the book, uh, if you haven't used it in your class, or if you haven't read it, is uh, basically uh, one long essay criticizing in very emphatic terms are leaders who are co-opted and selling out. And, uh, <laughs> I wanted it to reflect that frustration, but I also wanted it to reflect the fact that my position and what I was saying in there, and by extension, I guess the position and what people were saying in the communities at the time, wasn't just a rant. It wasn't a rant. It was grounded in 
the way of our being that has come to us as our heritage through our ceremonies, through our teachings, through our songs, through the oral histories, and through the established, I'd say, consensus in the community as to what the good way of life was, blending all of that. And so the structure of the book drew on, I was a bit worried at the time of this actually, it drew on uh, the condolence uh, ritual, the condolence ceremony, which uh, hadn't been done in our community, and there was no real direct experience, at least on my part, with that, um, it, which is where the worry came from, um, getting it right. Uh, what is the, what are the ethics around using that, and so forth, I grappled with all of that. But in the end, I was quite uh, satisfied that, as uh, satisfied with myself, that uh, the wisdom, the knowledge in that was the appropriate wisdom and knowledge to be used to stand up and bring a critique forward to those leaders who are taking our people uh, into the future. These are powerful people, not only in terms of political power, but to criticize them isn't to, isn't to deny the fact that they are personally powerful too, that they are convinced they are right, that they are very skilled, that a lot of them have integrity, that they believe in what they're doing, that they have long years of experience and commitment to the struggle. And so to stand up as a younger person at that time and to say, no, you're taking us down the wrong path. And many of you, many of you are doing it for the wrong reasons. And a minority of you are corrupt. And I want everybody to know that. To me, that was an intimidating thing to do at the time, and I needed to, to be blunt, the backup of our tradition and our knowledge and everything that our culture could, off, could, could afford me. And uh, that's the reason I used the structure of that book that way, because I, I really didn't really, I didn't feel comfortable as an individual with the level of experience I had, and the level of knowledge I had at that time, just saying, I'm frustrated with you all and stop selling us out. <laughs> uh, and everybody I know agrees with me. I had to have more uh, power behind me. And so I sought out the wisdom of elders and people, and in the end, I think, I, I believe at this point, that that critique still stands, in the sense that there's people who read this book, uh, it's since 99, who read it today and say, oh, he's saying exactly what's going on in my community, or he's talking about my chief. <laughs> or, you know, oftentimes people will say, you're talking about me. I had to put that book down five times. <laughs> it's only this, it's only this thing, you know, like you couldn't get through it. It's only, it's only that thing. No, I had to put it down five times because I was so angry and frustrated before I could get through it because you were actually talking about me. And, uh, well, good, because I was talking about me too. Again, remember what I said, where this book comes from, eh? and all this writing comes from is the personal journey. And so, um, at the time, the answer that came out of that, at least in our communities, and I saw it in a lot of other <coughs> communities, because I've had the opportunity since then to travel through the Royal Commission and afterwards to a lot of our brothers and sisters' communities and, and different nations. Um, the answer to that criticism was, and I characterize this apologies here, but just to be short on time here, traditionalism. Basically, the effort to restore the ancient ways of uh, governance, the ancient cultural ways, the ancient ways of relating to each other as a community that we that we understood was the community of our ancestors. Okay, so longhouse movements, uh, revivals of uh, traditional culture all across the all across the land here. Uh, long story short, people became frustrated with that as well because people, just like in regard to the capacity building endeavor, the traditionalist endeavor was found to be uh, in hindsight, again, an obvious point, based on people, based on women, men, kids, and elders. These were the people that were doing the ceremonies. These were the people that were running the longhouse. These were the people that were engaged in language revitalization. You and me, all of us. And people over time came to see that it wasn't simply enough to say, get the Indian off our, uh, Indian Act off our back, bring back the longhouse, let's all move in there, Let's all do our thing, and then we're going to be all like home and home again, all the way. Uh, I think instincts bring you and drive you forward in a movement, but then again, when you're living in it, you begin to see that it's not that easy. And I think that uh, I'm not giving away any secrets here to our non-native brothers and sisters, but um, the practice of traditionalism and in the ceremonial culture is also ridden with uh, problems. There's great power and strength 
and I still believe, don't misunderstand me, I still believe that is the foundation of our culture and our society. I'm totally committed to the, 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 the survival of that and the revitalization of that. But there's abuse, there's neglect, there's co-optation, there's manipulation, there's monetization, all, that, all these kind of words I could throw out as an academic, and people begin to see that it's not that simple. So colonization uh, was even more complex. It wasn't simply capacity building, self-government. It wasn't even simply the revitalization and the revival of the, of the traditional culture. People began to question, well, who is that person running that ceremony? <laughs> why, why is he doing these things? Uh, where did he come from? What is the effect? What am I getting out of it? What's happening? As, as naturally work will occur as people begin to relate in that basis and use that culture as a way of, of living their lives. And so people came to understand that, as I said a couple minutes ago, all of this is founded on people. And so the realization in my mind, and I think, of, and this, here's where the younger generation really came in, in terms of, of looking at the way both of these things were being done, self-government, community governance, uh, band governance, whatever it was, uh, traditional culture and practices, and being, and being, um, and, and evaluating it from their perspective of what is it, how is it helping me move through the world as more of an indigenous person than I was when I started this whole thing? How is it helping me become more indigenous? How is it helping me carry out my responsibilities in the context of the culture for my ancestors? And people found it wanting. Uh, a lot of people found it wanting. Uh, or just simply didn't have the power that they felt or uh, that they didn't experience the power, the transformative power that they knew deep inside was at the core of their own colonization. And so, again, it's a personal journey, uh, these things here. Uh, my own experience reflected that and I began to look for answers in ways and in places other than those that had been established as the decolonizing sites. Right? So I began to just talk to people in the community uh, who were experiencing this sense of frustration, again, at how their lives were still not together. They didn't feel together. They didn't feel like they had decolonized. They may be participants in the long run. They may even have learned a language. They may be doing a lot of things. They may be experiencing a community resurgence in terms of power, like in Guatemala, you know, community and example. Self-government, big funding, all kinds of things going on, very strong political identity, language revitalization and all that. There's still a, there's still a gap right here in, uh, in, in many people's, uh, I can say most, but in many people's uh, souls, um, psyche, body, whatever you want to say, where it's not complete. This process of decolonization just is not complete. And so I started to think about it again and taking up the responsibility. And I guess it's a bit of a luxury to be able to think like this because I'm not being drawn into working in the band council. Uh, I have a professor's job where, uh, you know, in case you don't know, it's probably the best job in the world, aside from the great papers. Uh, but uh, you know, you get to you get to really read and think and talk to people and really and really engage on things as a full time job. And so, taking up that responsibility, it wasn't as easy as this, the, the previous two phases because you know, with the first phase, you can count on the chiefs and the elders who were involved in the self government struggle to really inform and advise, and you had this whole context there. Similarly, with the second phase, as I'm talking about it here. There's the longhouse elders, there's the clan mothers, the chiefs, the base chiefs, there's that, you can go to that. This one, uh, this one in a sense was, well, who do we go to now, you know? If, if those are only part of the answer, what's, what's the real answer? Mm -hmm. And that was the real struggle, is to, to really find people and to develop a relationship and to, uh, and a relationship in terms of learning, mutual learning uh, and teaching as to, well, how do we get at that basic problem? And so for me, a lot of it was um, preparing myself uh, intellectually. Uh, I came to actually an understanding of uh, this phase, this next aspect of it, um, through reading some really important works, that, which I'm sure a lot of you have read already. Uh, if you haven't, you should. Uh, I'll just name one since I'm running short on time here, is uh, Franz Fanon. So I mean, I was, I was extremely uh, deeply influenced by now, actually, IGO is a phenomenon program. I think, you know, the program that I run is basically uh, founded on 
the process that he describes in terms in uh, black and white masks, basically, you know, where you really have to understand your psychic uh, closeness to the palmer. You have to understand yourself. You have to understand your obsessions and your desires. You have to understand all that stuff to really decolonize, and then you have to channel that into a political project that makes sense in terms of a break from uh, the power, the power of the colonizer to define who you are and what your future is. And so these previous phases, of course, are part of that. But if you think about it, where we are right now, if we take that movement or those two basic thrusts, um, where has it led us? And I think back, I, I look now at the landscape, we, we get to the psychic landscape of contemporary colonialism. If you look at where self-government has taken us, how many people hear the word nation, aside from the throwaway term, first nation, which really doesn't mean anything anymore. Uh, nationhood, how many leaders are operating on the basis of autonomous nationhood in contention with the Canadian state? There, there are very few, if any, leaders on the national or provincial scene who are operating from that premise and, and advocating goals and structuring their actions consistent with that struggle uh, for the revitalization of our nation. So in our communities, the Turo Wampa, uh, that's the guiding premise. Um, I don't know uh, how many people are really consistent, acting in a way that's consistent with that. I think there's a lot of rhetorical, there's a rhetorical difference to the idea, but look at what our politics are. Aboriginal politics, I've written about this in this book that followed, and here's a lot of my critiques that, that, that are in this book, Wasaze. Um, the whole notion of being an Aboriginal in Canada, to me, uh, seems like a betrayal of the heritage of struggle that our ancestors uh, put into our survival, and also in the previous two phases that I'm talking about here, through the 80s and the 90s, the whole notion of an Aboriginal, which is a, which is defined in terms of the Section 35, uh, the jurisprudence on Section 35 policy that comes from the Department of Justice, Department of Indian Affairs, and various other ministries, uh, adjudication of that to Canadian courts, and so forth. The whole notion of Aboriginal and trying to structure ourselves and deferring to that, and then anticipating this process, and even conceptualizing our goals is really the end, the end game of colonization, I call it that, in my book, because when we're thinking about our struggle, it has really nothing to do now with the taking back of land, with the re-imposition of our laws in our communities, and the, and the maintenance of an identity for our people that is rooted in our heritage, <coughs> our language, our world. Aboriginal politics today is really about uh, being consistent the notions, I would say false notions, or instrumental notions of indigeneity that have been created by judges, lawyers, consultants, and, indi and academics, indigenous and non-indigenous academics, in order to facilitate the removal of our people from the land. That has been the project from the beginning. Almost every time I talk, I say that. Like, just to remind people, uh, 500 or so years ago, people didn't come here to be friends. Uh, they didn't come here for anything else but to escape what they were escaping from the other part of the world they came from, and to exploit. And when they found that we were on the land and they found that we were in the way, and to the extent we didn't cooperate, they devised, they devised means, governmental, military, medical, and otherwise, to remove us from the land. Nothing's changed. It's still that. Think about the, the, the way I just said it. I set it up in terms of the dynamic, and apply that to Denede, or up north, or in northern BC, or or anywhere where the native opposes the development of the land for exploitative pur purposes, that native is defined out of existence or pushed out of pushed out of existence. And so the only way to survive in this political realm as a Canadian in an Aboriginal context, because uh, Aboriginal is defined in Canadian terms, in terms of citizenship, and all of us getting some share of what's going on having to balance the rights and the needs of the larger population with the Aboriginal population and so forth, the only way to survive is either to move out of the way or face destruction or redefine yourself so that you don't have a psychic conflict between who you think you are and what you're doing. 
So a lot of people are caught in this uh, dynamic, and I call myself caught in this too, and thinking through it is being an Aboriginal today is really uh, uh, a crazy, complicated hypocrisy. <laughs> when you think about it, Aboriginal, I mean, remember I'm talking about Aboriginal in contrast to Hongwe, Hongwe, Deme, uh, Sandwich, and all these words, uh, you know, being an Aboriginal finding yourself in terms that are coming down from Canadian courts and Canadian policy. And, and I should say also, the, the media, popular culture, the candlelit, uh, all, of, all of these things help to define us in ways which create a sense of ourselves as inauthentic. I mean, don't take me the wrong way with the word authenticity. By authenticity, all I mean is coming from ourselves. Okay? They're impositions. It's a crazy complicated thing. Because you know, on one hand, you're saying the reason I am being focused on and I have the attention of this society is because I am a first. Per I'm part of the First Nations. I am an <coughs> indigenous person. I was here first. Uh, we have a long heritage. We have a culture. <coughs> but then you're at the same breath saying, uh, "But I'm a Canadian, and Canadians defer to the democratic institution within the society." Canadians are citizens that have an ethnic heritage that is respected to a certain extent in a lot in Canada. But in no way, no how, do Aboriginal Canadians have a right to trump the rights of other Canadians. The, juris, the, the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court is very clear. Any case you want to mention is that it's all about balancing the overwhelming need of the Canadian society to continue to progress with the remnant rights what is it? They're, they're a burden on Crown Title, in, in the language of, uh, of the Aboriginal Rights uh, Aboriginal Title Law. It's a consideration. Well, I don't think that that is really something that you could square. That's the argument I make in my book here. The reason we have this big gap in our souls here, the reason we feel empty, and the reason we feel like a bunch of hypocrites here, is because of the fact that we've accepted other person's definition of ourselves and we're living it up. We're living out someone else's notion of what it is to be indigenous personal life. We were true to our own original visions and the teachings that come through the ceremonies, that come through our ancestors, and even if we just read our own history, read books and, and looked at the way our ancestors talked and the way they, they acted, well, we wouldn't be doing any of this, politically or even culturally. And so the book of Osage is basically another attempt to kind of draw very clear lines between what is the pathway, what are the pathways because of course there's cultural diversity among indigenous peoples and there's different realms of action and so forth. What are the pathways that have integrity from an indigenous perspective? And what are those that are obvious aboriginalist uh, co-optations and oriented towards the assimilation and the eventual destruction of our people? And uh, that book works through a lot of different types of perspectives. Um, it works through very, very clear guidance from at least 13, if I'm correct, if I remember correctly, uh, people who I spoke with uh, to get insight and gain experience from and to actually have something to say about this. The conclusion in that book is that uh, in the context of this whole Aboriginal framework, which of course has led to the notion of reconciliation, which I'm talking about tomorrow at McGill, which I just can't wait to go off on. <laughs> uh, reconciliation as surrender, uh, basically defining us as victims of progress and people who are unable to keep up and need help. People who need to be, need to be brought up to speed, people who need to be brought into the mainstream, people who need to be taught how to live in this, in, in this world here. Uh, if, if, if you accept that, in my view, you might as well stop, you know, you might as well just be a Canadian. You might as well join the project. You might as well just stop talking about the idea of Mohawk Nation, creation. Because think about what that represents. That represents the disillusion of any independent basis for an existence in this land. It's, it's sort of what goes on in, in societies all over the world where people become, become integrated and over time, generationally, lose the original sense of themselves. And over time, I guess it can be made, the argument can be made that that is natural, that is uh, even good. People can make the argument that that's good, that's progress. You know, people coming from, from the forest into the city and, but if you're gonna do that, my point in this Wasazi book is if you're gonna do that, 
don't call yourself a First Nations activist. Don't call yourself an indigenous person, really, because the indigenous person only exists in the context of the heritage and the elements of an indigenous identity which were handed down to us from <coughs> ancestors not even that far removed, one or two or three generations removed. And those things are very, very clear. In every nation, in every part of, uh, of the country, you don't have to make such an extensive effort to dig up or to uncover what those teachings are, what those, uh, what those defining features of what it is to be an indigenous person. All you need to do is talk to an elder or, or go around and participate in some ceremonies or, or participate in community life as it's oriented towards cultural practice on the land. And those things become very, very evident. And then you go and you try to relate that to the existence that you have in law, politics, economics, and academia here, and you see a great disjuncture. And so the, the real struggle that I face right now, and I think a lot of us are facing, uh, I hear this through my students, and, and when I go around the topic, this is, well, what, how do you uh, continue to confront, if we understand all of this, what do we do? You know, what's next? And I think that uh, the answer that has come to me through the work that I've done in, uh, in Abu Zasne over the last seven years, those of you who don't know where Abu Zasne is, it's uh, about an hour from here, it's a small community uh, on the St. Lawrence outside of Cornwall. Long history of uh, activism and leadership in, uh, in, in the indigenous world. And I, in my experience over the last seven years in being asked by the community there to, to think through the, the effects of the loss of their connection to the natural environment, has really brought me to an understanding of what colonization is uh, at the core. Uh, and, uh, I'm not saying the journey of knowledge is uh, ended for me in any, in any way, but I'm starting to get at a core understanding uh, in my own life, and I think that in dialogue with the people that I've worked with in that community, and, and then having written and talked about it in other communities, it's starting to get there. It's starting to, to really get at the heart of what it is. And the real heart of it is, what colonization did was separate us from the natural environment, from our land. When we say we're separated from the land, we're dispossessed. Okay, that's a, that's a legal uh, term. Dispossession, that's a legal term. We understand what that means, a legal term. What does it mean to us in terms of the way we live our life, the way we experience our life? I didn't really understand that intellectually, uh, to be able to process it, to talk about it, although I lived it in Kahnawagi myself, until I worked in Abu Zasne on this question of what has been the effect of, uh, in that case, it's a very specific uh, problem, uh, the effect of industrial contamination, basically PCBs in the river and uh, on the land. What has been the effect culturally on the people there? And so having worked through this um, over the last, I guess it's seven years now, I've come to realize that the disconnection from the land has had the most profound effect on our people in terms of our ability to sustain ourselves psychically, culturally, and physically as indigenous peoples. I mean, the obvious point is to look at the health effects. Uh, and by saying it's obvious, I'm not, I'm not making light of it. It's a very, very important issue to, to look at. The health effects are very obvious. You know, traditional diets, people talk about traditional diets and the replacement of all these junk foods and so forth, and, and uh, even the practices. Um, the practices in terms of the lifestyle that we live to maintain our bodies in a healthy way uh, being forgotten or lost or inaccessible now and we have this kind of sedentary lifestyle. That's all a big factor. Uh, culturally, the loss of the land meant the loss of actual collective activity on the land, which meant the loss of the transmission of knowledge. That is the way our people learn, that is the way our people taught and learn, and that is the way uh, understanding of a world of you, relationship to other elements of creation, language was all transmitted in that context there. You stop doing that and you all sit in front of a TV, um, it ain't gonna happen. And you can, you can trace the decline, which we unfortunately have to do. My job is very depressing for seven years. <laughs> you basically trace the decline of the Mohawk nation in Abu Zasne. You know, who would sign up for that? <laughs> so, I, I did. And, you know, uh, I, I learned as we went along some positive things, but I also learned a lot of negative things, basically tracing this process. But the most important part for me was the, the psychological effect of uh, being disconnected from your land. Because all of this, the things that I described about the health effects, 
the language loss, the loss of kinship, relationship, the transmission of knowledge and all that stuff had the effect of really creating a sense of uh, alienation, uh, a deep sense of alienation in, in the people that. Uh, what that breeds is a sense of distrust in each other, in oneself, in the future. I think you see where I'm getting at, where I'm going with this, in the sense that the dispossession of native peoples through colonization in its most profound effect is the creation of a sense of alienation which, which creates the context for most of the social ills and the psychological ills that get played out in our communities. And, address, and attempting to address these in economic or political structural or any other way other than finding a way to reconnect the people to the sources of their existence, their power, is futile. Found that you know, it was us into it. And it's not to say that all of a sudden with that realization everything changed and everybody's happy and healthy and all you know 100 percent Mohawk again. <laughs> but I think that the understanding is the key on an individual and collective basis to really addressing colonization at the heart of it. And so I'm not saying that in order to be truly native uh, and to live a native life today, you all have to wear buckskin feathers and beads, although it's nice on some days, you know, it's nice for people to do that. Uh, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that you have to have a sense of yourself that comes from that place in order to live and interact in this overwhelmingly colonial society if you're ever going to survive as an indigenous person and maintain yourself in the future and transmit something of what it means to be a Mohawk or a Cree or an Algonquin going forward. That the normal the normal needs to be that, as opposed to this crazy life that most of us live either in the city or uh, on, a, on a reserve somewhere. If that's the normal, then what are we giving uh, as a legacy to our kids? At best, it's uh, mainstream middle class consumerist values. Uh, in Mohawk. <laughs> so, but you speak Mohawk, but you're doing all the mainstream capitalist uh, consumerist things, and you might be able to speak Cree or Algonquin or whatever, but you're not doing anything substantially different. Uh, your ancestors, would they recognize you? They probably walk in and say, hey, look at that white man talking Mohawk. <laughs> <laughs> so, in Mohawk, of course, you can't even say that. But uh, the, uh, the central point, I think, of where I've come in all of this intellectual work, in all this political work, in all of this journeying and trying to find teachers, is that the answer has been the same as always. I remember at the Royal Commission, some of the elders and some of the teachers, mostly women, saying, it's about the land. It's all about the land. And at the time, we went, yeah, of course it is. You know, we're going to get back some land. And no, it's about the land. You need, you need to understand on a deeper level. <clears throat> Even self government negotiates a lot of elders, you know. It's about the land. We need to get our land back. We need to have a relationship with the land. Well, when it comes down to it, we don't have a relationship with our land. Uh, hardly anymore. And I think that our existence reflects that. And our sense of indigeneity reflects that. And our politics reflects that. And so if we're going to survive, this has always been my my preoccupation. Um, people are involved, and many people are involved in all these other aspects. And like I said earlier, with intention, they think they're doing a good thing, they're committed to this other people. But think about it in these terms. If success is the ability of me to live as a Mohawk, in my territory and to, to go about in the world with a Mohawk worldview, with a sense of connection to my ancestors, to the spirit world, and to carry myself that in a way that our ancestors would honor. Well, I can't get that from the outside. That has to come from my culture. And my culture is land based. <coughs> and so the land is important in that respect. And if the criteria of success is beyond the individual, to have a community that fosters this in its youth teaches it to its children multi-generationally. And if a criteria of success is to have the next generation of kids having the opportunity to be more native than we are, if the next generation of kids have the opportunity to be more native than we are in all of these different ways, that's success. Because we're coming from a very colonized existence, every, every single one of us. And the criteria of success shouldn't be 
them having more money in exchange for being even less native, we're already starting from, from an extremely precarious position. So what I'm arguing for is a criteria of success to say, my four-year-old, whatever, whatever kids that are born, if that little guy and the kids coming forward can honestly have the opportunity, if they so choose, to live on their land, to live off their teachings, to believe in themselves and to see themselves and relate to others as an indigenous person, uh, to me, that's the, that's the criteria that we should be shooting for. Not any other criteria before, defined in legal terms, economic terms, or cultural or intellectual terms coming from someone else. The society has always been and remains oriented towards the removal of us from any authentic sense of ourselves and from the land. So, if I was to rewrite these books and go back, I might just tweak them a little bit and say, uh, here's my criteria of success, Mr. Chief, Mr. National Chief. Uh, what are you doing to advance the ability of our younger generation to live more as a native? Uh, has nothing to do with money, really. Money's nice and secondary though to that project. What are you sacrificing in order to achieve that money? And now, uh, unfortunately, my analysis, and maybe I'll finish here, I've been talking for a long time, is that um, most of our understanding of what colonization and decolonization are still come from other still are oriented towards satisfying the demands, the imperatives, the preferences even, of other people, as opposed to the profound need in our community for a reorientation away from those understandings and the giving of hope and chance and opportunity for a younger generation to live as an Ogumoe uh, on their own territory. With that, I'll finish, and uh, I think I've saved a little bit of time for some comments and questions.